We're going to do a little bit of double duty today here for this message. Um, it's Palm Sunday. For 2,000 years, we've celebrated Palm Sunday. But we're also on the last Sunday of the text that we are looking at in the Gospel of John on the crucifixion and the, now today the burial of Jesus. That might seem a little bit confusing, but here's why it's important. So often in the church, we, we run the risk of celebrating on Palm Sunday. We have the parade and the palms, and it's cool, and the kids are here, and everybody's in such a good mood, and we know that it's reason to celebrate because we're remembering the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And then the next time so many of us get together is Resurrection Sunday, where we're talking about Jesus walking out of the grave, and we bypass all of Holy Week. We skip the trial, we skip the flogging, we skip, skip the crucifixion and the death. And we're only there for the Sundays that we celebrate. And so we've been spending more time making sure that we're clear about what Jesus really went through on our behalf on the cross so that when we gather next Sunday, we really understand why it is that we have such a reason to celebrate. And so today, while we're going to be talking about Palm Sunday, we're also going to be talking about what happened to Jesus while he was on the cross and where it was that he was buried but more than just that, we're going to talk about how all of those things together in events from the Old Testament all pull together to show that God has been at work for a very, very long time. And you're going to understand more about that in just a little bit. So get ready to cover some ground if you've got your Bibles. John 19, starting in the 31st chapter. Since it was the day of preparation and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath for that Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. The day of preparation, preparation for what? Well, it's Sabbath, but the Bible says it's a high Sabbath. The high Sabbath was the reason that everybody was in town in Jerusalem in the first place. It was Passover. It was a big deal. Part of the reason that we realize Jesus hanging on a cross outside of town is going to draw so much attention is because people from all over what we now know as Israel are coming to Jerusalem to celebrate this week. They're coming to celebrate the Passover. God was well aware of the foot traffic that would be in the city. So what is Passover about? It's the day that the Israelites remember when they were in captive, captivity in Egypt. But here's the thing, when we look at this verse, we've got to take a look at what's really going on here. It's a day of preparation because they're concerned about being ready for Sabbath and for Passover. And so the bodies wouldn't remain on the cross for the Sabbath. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. The church people. Not just the leaders. The church people. Got word to Pilate that we're getting ready for this big celebration of ours, this religious celebration of ours, and we don't want dead men or dying men hanging on the cross. We need them to die and be taken down. So Pilate, would you break their legs to speed it up already because we've got a party to get to? The church people go to Pilate and ask him to break the legs of the men who are already being crucified as if the pain and the suffering weren't enough. Why? So that the the religious folks could feel good about their religious preparation and their celebration. They were more concerned about keeping their own rules than they were about their part in the sin of the murder of the Son of God. That's really what's being said in this verse. That's what we need to understand. That's what John wants to get across to us. I look back on it, I think these ridiculous church people are afraid of the possibility of offending God by daring to leave a man die hanging from a cross who they had put there. Did they not consider the offense of putting to death the very Son of God and being the ones who hung him there in the first place? They're worried that he gets taken down so that they can feel good about their preparation. And as I thought about this, I realized we could end this message right here. We're not going to, but we could. I realized we've got to be careful, church. Sometimes the greater offense isn't the one that we're all too willing to point out in someone else. The greater offense isn't pointing out someone else's sin. Sometimes the greater offense is the thing in ourselves that we find reasons and excuses to overlook. 
the greater offense is oftentimes the sin in ourselves that we overlook because we don't want to see it. That's what was happening here. Verse 32. So the soldiers came and they broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. This is the final statement of proof that John makes that Jesus is in fact definitely dead on the cross. He wants to make sure that we understand that. Jesus truly died on the cross that day. There is another increasingly loud religion in our world that says that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. Like every other statement and claim that particular religion makes, it is nothing but a lie of the devil to discredit the work that God does in the world with the redeeming love of Jesus. John wants to make sure that we understand that Jesus really did die. The reason he talks about the blood and water flowing out isn't because John had a, a background in medicine and he wanted us to see that. In fact, 2,000 years ago, they understood very little of it, but we looked at last week and we said that when a man was hung on a cross, more often than not, he died of asphyxiation. He just simply couldn't breathe anymore. The muscles didn't work. He couldn't lift himself in order to be able to take a breath. And what we know now, 2,000 years later, is that when a human being dies of asphyxiation, one of the things that they see in an autopsy is that the pericardial sac that surrounds the heart fills with water as the man is struggling for air. And so when that side pier, uh, spear pierced the side of Jesus, it punctured the pericardial sac and entered his heart, and what fell out was blood and water. We understand that 2,000 years later. John didn't. We know what John could not have known. But John recorded what he saw. Verse 35, he who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth that you also might believe. John recorded these events not knowing the medical significance. John recorded them not knowing how we would be able to read it 2,000 years later with our additional knowledge. The only thing that John knew is that he was recording the events as they happened. And what does he mean that you might believe? Believe that Jesus really died on the cross that day, of course. See, 2,000 years later, we look at it and our medical understanding fills in the significance of that spear puncture and the blood and the water that came out, we understand it in a different way. But when we're able to grasp that because of what John recorded for us, the real death of Jesus on the cross that day makes his real res resurrection from the tomb that we celebrate next Sunday that much more of a miracle. John had no idea the significance of what he was writing down. He just wrote down what he observed. Verse 36, for these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And another scripture says they will look on him whom they have pierced. There's no way in the world for the skeptics who have said Jesus was a con man and he put himself in the right place at the right time. There's no way in the world that Jesus could have controlled whether or not the Romans broke the bones of the men on the cross to speed up their death. There certainly is no way that Jesus could have gotten them to put a spear in his side after he had died. God gave us those prophecies, promises that had yet to come true, and we saw them come true here on earth that day. Verse 38, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who we have not been introduced to yet, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took away his body. Joseph of Arimathea was a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the temple and church. But Joseph of Arimathea did not agree with the Sanhedrin's desire to put Jesus to death. In fact, Joseph of Arimathea was a quiet follower, a disciple of Jesus. We also find out from people who write about these days in other books of history that are not the Bible, that Joseph of Arimathea was the second wealthiest man in Jerusalem at that time. 
Joseph of Arimathea had a large estate just outside the walls of the city. And his large estate included a garden, his home, apparently quite a, a bit of land for his family to spend time on, a wine press, and a newly cut tomb in the rock of the garden. Verse 39, Nicodemus also, who had earlier come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. Nicodemus was also a member of the Sanhedrin. Nicodemus also did not agree with their call to put Jesus to death. Nicodemus was also a quiet disciple of Jesus for fear of what the Jews might do to him. It turns out that we find out from this passage, Nicodemus was also quite wealthy. 75 pounds of myrrh and aloe is an awful lot of expensive things to bring to someone who's already died. And so these two men go to gather Jesus' body. Verse 40, they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. They buried him as a Jew. Why? Because as Pilate had said on the sign, he is the king of the Jews. So they wrapped and honored him with respect in his death, two men who finally took a stand for what they believed. They took a stand for Jesus. Verse 41, now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. We know from last week that he was crucified at a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull, a single skull. I showed you a photograph that we took when we were in Israel where the, the rock face for 2,000 years has appeared as though it is the, the outline of a skull. Interestingly, it's about a block away that there's a place called the Garden Tomb in Jerusalem. It's all one connected piece of land. Here's a picture of the door of the tomb in this large garden. Interestingly, it's about a block. If, as you stand looking at this, Golgotha is right over here. There is a large garden that surrounds the whole thing. Golgotha is less than a block away. Just to our left in the photograph is a wine press that remains. Is this the garden of Joseph of Arimathea? I don't know. But it checks all the boxes for what the Bible is talking about here. Uh, one of the things that we have to understand when we go to the Holy Land, when you, when you study things in Israel, uh, not everything is as advertised. And so we don't really know. They, they don't have uh, land ownership records the way that we do in our country. And so there's always room for discussion. But this garden and that tomb, in connection to where Golgotha is, checks all the boxes that John gives us in his gospel for where this may have all happened. Verse 42, so because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. They needed to get him wrapped up and into a tomb before sundown, before Sabbath began. Because it was only a block between Golgotha and that door to the tomb that you just saw, it seems like that is an awfully likely location. Back to the idea of all the misinformation in the Holy Land. When Constantine became an emperor and he decided that he was going to become Christian, the whole empire became Christian, his mom, Helena, decided that she was going to go to the Holy Land and went to Jerusalem, and she started declaring a lot of locations as the place where different things happened. And so much of Jerusalem today is described the way that she described it 1,600 years ago. It looks very different because oftentimes she commissioned large cathedrals to be built uh, as a way of honoring and claiming the space. Are they right? I don't know. Some of them strike me as probably not being quite consistent with Scripture. So can I tell you that this is the tomb that Jesus was laid in? I can't. But it checks all the boxes, and it's a perfect representation. And so while I was there, uh, I, I did what they tell you you're not supposed to do it. It says, please don't take pictures inside of the tomb because they want to keep people moving because there's one little door in and one little door out. And I thought, I'm taking pictures for 1,500 people. They can wait a moment. So here's a picture from the inside the door of that tomb. This is an area that's cut in when you walk in the door. It's to your right. And there's this thing called a niche. And that's where they would have wrapped and laid the body for the first part of the time that it was buried. Is this the tomb they laid Jesus in? I don't know. I can't tell you that. I can tell you that when you read through the gospel accounts, 
This one most closely relates to all the boxes that you would line up and check off as, as the right location. It's interesting, what they call those is a niche. It's a burial niche. You've heard the word, right? We've got a phrase over it. There's an itch for everybody, right? There's a place that we're all going to go when we die. There's a niche for everybody. If you look at that and you think, wow, and it kind of puts a lump in your throat, it really does, the idea that just possibly 2,000 years ago, after his death on the cross, from just a few hundred feet the other direction, that they carried Jesus' body and that they might have laid him there. That brings the Bible to life in a very new and different way. And yes, it's um, a very emotional thing to walk into that little space. If you get the chance, I would encourage you to do it. Let's talk a little bit about Passover, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. This big celebration that everyone is coming to Jerusalem to be a part of. What's Passover? Well, it's recorded in Exodus, the 12th chapter. You'll remember there was a time in the history of Israel that uh, they were held captive in Egypt. And the Israelites were slaves, and so God comes to Moses, and he says, I want you to go, and I want you to free my people. And Moses has this wonderful history among the Egyptian people. And, of course, Moses says, no, I'm the wrong guy, and God says, I want you to go. So Moses goes to Pharaoh, and he says, would you please let God's people go? And Pharaoh says, no. And there's this conversation that goes on, and what results is the plagues of Egypt. And finally, when Pharaoh refuses to relent, God calls for the Israelites, and this is recorded in Exodus 12. God calls for the Israelites to each family, depending on how many people, they maybe two families would share, but God says, I want all of you to take a lamb, a perfect, without blemish lamb, and I want you to bring it into your house on Sunday, and I want you to hold it for four days, and on the fourth day, I want you to slaughter that lamb, and you're going to take the blood of the lamb, and you're going to put it over the doorpost of your home, over the top and down the sides, and then you're going to eat the meat of the lamb, and then you're going to burn everything else up. It's Passover. God says, for every home that has the blood of the lamb over the door, the angel of death will pass over. Otherwise, all the firstborn in the land of Egypt died. And what the Israelites are doing is they'll go back and they're remembering what Passover was, that God did this incredible thing, this incredible miracle. By simply spreading the blood of the lamb over the doorposts of their homes, that was the sign that they were to be left alone. They were saved by the blood of the lamb. And so it's not at all like, unlike God in the least that we would call Jesus, the Lamb of God. But if you think it's just interesting coincidence, it is not. The Bible makes it clear that God is at work in other ways as well. Everyone is gathered in Jerusalem during Passover so that the Lamb of God is crucified outside the gates of the city as everybody from the area around passes through and sees him dying on the cross. And the church people are more worried about taking him down so they don't offend their religious rules than they are about the fact that they put him there to die in the first place. The Lamb of God who died for the sin of the world when all they're worried about is gathering to remember when the Lamb's blood saved them from death. So what we can't miss today is that God doesn't do this stuff by coincidence. The Bible doesn't record it by accident. All those of us who look at it and study it aren't trying to find neat pieces that might fit together. No, God put them there and wove them together so that we could find them. God's woven more into the Bible and into every passage than we're ever going to hope to understand. So let's go back to Palm Sunday. With that history of why it is that everyone is in Jerusalem, what they're all excited about, let's go back to that Sunday that Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey and this parade breaks out and we have the palms now because in Jerusalem there would have been a lot of palms. They would have put cloaks, they would have put blankets on the ground as a way for the donkey to walk that would have just been a sign of respect for the king that was riding a donkey. Now the first thing that happened was Israel wasn't very excited because Jesus didn't ride a horse and he didn't have an army in tow. How in the world is he going to take over and bring them back? How is he going to be a savior if there's no army? They wanted a military king like David. Jesus instead rides into town on a donkey. Uh, one of the things you need to know in the culture of the time, a military hero who came and expected to take over by force would ride a war horse. A military king who came over and rode a donkey was a sign that he came in peace. They didn't want that. 
And so as soon as that parade broke out, there were people that were not happy. It was full of excitement, anticipation, and hope, but right off the bat, there was something about it that they just weren't happy about. Their long-awaited king, the Messiah, the Savior of the Jewish people, had arrived. However, he did not arrive the way that they wanted him to. And that parade, rather than reaching a culmination at the temple, fell apart very quickly. But it was another important day in Jerusalem that day. See, John tells us that Jesus died on the night of preparation, the night before Sabbath and Passover, when they're doing all of the work so that they don't have to do any work for the Sabbath. And so all the work that needed to be done for them to take a day off and completely rest would be done in the week ahead of time, especially the day before. And this being Passover, there was a lot to be done because it was a big celebration. The food would need to be prepared. The work would need to be completed. And so the lambs that they would slaughter in memory of the Passover would need to be slaughtered on Thursday night. But here's the thing. They were a very ritual people, and so there was also a lamb selection day that each family chose the perfect without spot, spot and blemish lamb that they would slaughter as an atonement for their sins in, in remembering the Passover. Lamb selection day was what we call Palm Sunday. The day that all of the families in Jerusalem would be choosing the lamb that would be the one that would take as an atonement their sins. So the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world was presented to Jerusalem on lamb selection day, what we now call Palm Sunday. And then at the end of the week, just like all those other lambs, Jesus, the spotless and perfect Son of God, the Lamb of God, was slaughtered for the sins of human beings. Graphic language. But it's exactly what happened. So the day is Palm Sunday. It's the day the Jewish people chose their lambs for the sacrifice of Passover. The day the Lamb of God was presented to Israel as their atoning sacrifice. Jesus, the Lamb of God, who was crucified for the sins of all who would believe in him. He gave his life so that you could live fully and freely. Not so that you could live in your sin, but rather freely forgiven and separated from our sin. In John 12, 32, Jesus says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. When was Jesus lifted up from the earth? Jesus was lifted up from the earth when he was nailed to the cross, and they lifted that cross and dropped it into the ground. Jesus was now lifted above the earth. Verse 35, he says, you're going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. So what are you going to do? You understand darkness. Sin. It's that power of sin that takes over and completely overwhelms us at times. Darkness is that thing that starts with us slowly, but by the time that we're all the way in, we don't even realize that we're in darkness because it just becomes so normal. People don't even miss the light because they're so used to the darkness. Jesus says, be in the light while you have it. It's only for a short amount of time before the darkness overtakes you. Here we are, Palm Sunday, it's Lamb Selection Day. What are you going to do today? What are you going to do right now? Are you going to walk in the light or are you going to do what we're so good at is to waffle and waver until the darkness of sin overtakes you? And we've got excuses, we've got reasons, we can explain it away. Well, this is why, I'm, I'm not really doing that. That's the pervasive power of sin, of darkness. Jesus died so that you and I might walk in the light with him even as the darkness presses in all around us. So what will you do? Where will you live? What will you live for? Where will you walk? Will you walk in the light or will you sneak away to walk in the darkness? See, the Lamb of God gave his life for you. Will you give your life to him? It's the difference between the light and the darkness. What will you do? Let's pray.
God, thank you for the power of your word. Thank you, God, that as we begin to study your word, there is no way that the number of people who you called to put down the chapters and the books in the Bible could have, through all those years, coordinated with each other to create one book that tells us, tells a seamless story of your son. The pieces and the details that we're able to uncover aren't hiding from us. They're just there waiting for us to find them. And so as we celebrate Palm Sunday, we also need to realize that today is also Lamb Selection Day. And you sent your son to be the one who paid the price for our sin, who died in our place. God, let us never take that lightly. Let us not simply accept it as some interesting historical information we hadn't heard before. But God, change us. In the power of your Holy Spirit, God, change our hearts. Change our thinking. Change how and the way that we want to live. That we would give up living for ourselves. That we wouldn't just accept calling Jesus our Savior. But that we would submit our lives to him. And that we would make him our Lord. That we would not be the people today and tomorrow that we were when we woke up and who we were yesterday. God, thank you for what you did for us in Jesus that we could not do for ourselves. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Luke 9, 23, 24 says, And he said to all, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Thing is, every single one of us is going to give our life to something or someone. You're going to give your resources, your time, and what you believe in. You're going to give it to someone or something. Make sure that that is the only thing that is worthy of it. Some of you may be saying this morning, you know what, I, I, I really have never known Jesus I'm ready. I'd like to get to know him. We've got folks in the four corners that would love to pray with you right now. Maybe what you're saying is, I used to actually be really close to Jesus. I, I, I spent a lot of time with him. I've strayed. You know what? Jesus is saying, come on home. And he's waiting for you. And maybe for some of you, it's just you have been a part of the faith world with Jesus for a very long time, and you're close. And what Jesus is really doing is saying, maybe this message today is an invitation to grow deeper. But Jesus is there waiting for you. Wherever you are on your road to him, he is there waiting for you. And so what I want to say is whatever you do, don't hear about Jesus and then choose to give your life to something else. Jesus gave his life for you. All that he's waiting for you to do is to turn around and give your life to him.